<clears throat> Not many authors span the genre the way you, that you do. You pretty much go from one end of the spectrum to the other. Was that more um, a depiction of your growth as a writer, or were you just experimenting in all the areas? It's, it's never been deliberate, really. I mean, um, all I can say is that I'm a Gemini with Gemini rising. <laughs> and that means at any given time, there's four of us in here. Me. <laughs> <laughs> and I do, I get, I get bored very quickly. I have a very low boredom threshold. Um, I suppose because I read widely across the genre, I have a very strong sense of, of, of what the possibilities are. Um, and so it seems to me whatever idea strikes fertile ground, I'm going to find a way, a shape of story to tell that story. If it's interesting enough to me to want to tell it, then I will find a way to write the story. And I don't really care if it's, you know, that ends up being a private eye novel or it ends up being, you know, sort of um, some sort of psychological thriller or if it ends up being, you know, a, a quasi-historical quest like the Dave Tattoo. For me, if the story is, is like battering away in the, in the back of my head, it needs to be told. And so I'll find a way to tell it. And I know this is sometimes confusing for readers. And I know that uh, not all of my readers love all of my books equally. Um, but I'm really sorry about that. There's nothing I can do about it. <laughs> so, I write the books that, that I need to write because they're the books that are sort of you know, making the loudest noise in the back of my mind. Um, and and uh, I've never written a book because I thought that was what people expected of me next. I've always written a book that, um, that excited me. Um, your Tony and Carol series is uh, sometimes labeled as Tartan Noir. First of all, how do you feel about that label? Well, I think Tartan Noir is, is, um, is a reasonable uh, uh, category, if you like. I mean, you know, as part of me thinks that labels are for jam. Um, <laughs> but, but also, I, I do understand that, that uh, they, are, they can be quite useful because people can identify the sort of books that appeal to their taste. Um, although I do think that everybody should go out and read as widely as possible and not just read one kind of book. Um, because that way you miss an awful lot of good stuff. And you end up also reading a lot of mediocre stuff. Um, but. Uh, the, the Tartan Noir, I suppose, re refers to the sort of new wave of Scottish crime fiction that's really emerged since the 1990s. And there is, there's a historical reason um, why Scottish crime writers suddenly sort of emerged. Um, in the late 1970s, a writer called William McIlvanny wrote a book called Laidlaw, which was an extraordinary crime novel. I had never read anything like it when it came out. And I don't think it was a coincidence that at the same time that Laidlaw was written, Scotland was talking about devolution. For the first time in 300 years, we were talking about some degree of political self-determination. And that meant thinking about who we were, what it meant to be Scottish, trying to define who we were in the modern world, trying to define ourselves in something other than we're not English and we hate them. <laughs> <laughs> and and so, so I think, I think with Laidlaw, William Applevani sowed a seed. And as Scotland began, talking to itself much more about the country it wanted to be and much more about what the country it could become. Um, and the notion of devolution and political self-determination, it, it became clear that the world of literature, we needed a way to write about this, to talk about this to ourselves, to have the conversation that wasn't just a dry political conversation in, 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 in a group of, of, of people talking about what Scotland was going to be if it got a, a parliament. And so um, writers like myself and Ian Rankin started writing crime fiction because it was clear that the crime novel had become um, I mean, the novel of, 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 of social commentary it was the place you go to write about the society you live in. And, it, and with the crime novel, you can write right across the whole breadth of society. You're not writing about some wee hermetic group, you know, six people in North London having dinner parties. Uh, the crime novel has a big sweep and a big reach because you've got, you've got the victims, you've got the families and friends of the victims, you've got the police who are investigating this, you've got the media who get drawn into it, you've got the witnesses, you've got the innocent bystanders who get pulled into the story. You've got a chance to write a huge sweep of society in your books in the way that someone like Charles Dickens did with the Victorian era, so the crime novel has the potential to do today. But if you want to focus in tight and narrow, you can also do that. So you've got everything there at your disposal. So as, as we started sort of examining who we were, it seemed clear that the crime novel was, was one way to do this. And it's one of those things that, you know, like if a couple of people start to do something and are, are a bit successful at it, then other people see that as a possibility. It, it opens up a possibility for them as writers that didn't exist before. And so I think other young writers coming up behind me and Ian saw this as a possible way to go. And so 
the nervous, you know, like a huge swathe of really good Scottish crime writing. And it seems like every time you turn around, there's another one coming over the horizon. And frankly, I think someone should just go away now. <laughs> you made the point, okay? <laughs> um, but, I, but, I, but I think that um, what has ended up as so, so-called tartan noir has a distinct identity. And that identity really uh, comes from the fact that our, our history, if you like, our literary history, does not go uh, through Agatha Christie and, and the Golden Age and, and, and then in through you know, P.D. James and, 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 and Ruth Rendell. Our literary history, if you like, begins with James Hogg's The Confessions of a Justified Sinner, and it comes through Robert Louis Stevenson's Jekyll and Hyde, and it comes through Conan Doyle's dark, foggy streets of London that we really all know are actually the dark, foggy streets of Edinburgh. Um, and through that into the, the modern, contemporary darkness of Laidlaw. And what these books have in common uh, is, is a fascination with the dark side of the psyche. You know, in Scotland, we've always had this, this kind of the war between the two halves of our, our, our history, if you like, the two halves of our, our national personality. It's what the, the poet Hugh McDermott called the Caledonian anti-syzygy, which is the yoking together of two opposing forces. It's quite a useful Scrabble word. Um, <laughs> and, um, the idea with this is that on the one hand you've got the sort of Presbyterianism, the Calvinism, the straight lace that you've got to behave yourself or else. And then on the other side you've got the, let's have a party and open up the whiskey! <laughs> so, um, which perhaps you're more familiar with. <laughs> so you've got this, this dynamic tension between these two sides of the Scottish psyche. And I think that's given us a fascination with, with the psychological, with the darkness, with the dark places, the dark night of the soul. But in tandem with that, you've also got the Scottish sense of humour, which is very black and very dark. Uh, and, and, and so I think that you know, when you read the books of, of writers like myself, like Ian Rankin, like Denise Miner, like Christopher Brookmeyer, um, right through to the writers coming through now, like Carol Ramsey, um, what you see is these common factors, this, this interest in, in the sort of psychological darkness, but also the black humour that, that, that sends these sort of lightning bolts of, of brightness through the books. You've kind of divided yourself, your parts up, amongst your characters, I think. I hope a lot of people here can uh, agree with me when I say that Lindsay shares your uh, career in journalism, uh, Kate has your spirit and wit, Tony your intelligence, Carol your drive, um, and you talked Thursday about how um, writers are kind of like the vampires and they're sucking all the blood out of themselves, and then they go after people they know. Um, Be afraid. <laughs> Be very afraid. Do you do that intentionally, or is it more subconsciously? That's just the characteristics that come as oh, you write. Just let me get some more blood in my glass here. <laughs> um, I think it's. I don't know how conscious it is. I mean, it's it's like in the back of my head is this huge data set of everybody I've ever known and everything I've ever seen and all the characters I've come across in, in my life and, and the situations I've experienced. And having been a journalist for a long time, that opened a lot of doors to me. Um, and, and you find yourself usually dealing with people in, in quite extreme circumstances. And what you, what you see there is, is you get a window on all these lives and all these situations that you'd never otherwise get the chance to see. So you're, you're in... You're in company with the highest in the land and the lowest in the land. You're in company with people in all sorts of crises. Um, sometimes the people who've won a lot of money on the lottery or something like that, but more often than not, the people whose lives have just fallen apart one way or another. Somebody they know has been murdered, their house is burned down. For whatever reason, they find themselves at the heart of a news story. Um, and all of that stuff just gets filed away in the back of my head. So whenever I'm thinking about a character and what I need the character to do in this book, then I could generally find something in the filing system that works for me as a, as a way into that character, as a window into who they are and how they got to be that way. If your characters were flesh and blood people, would you be friends with them or would they drive you nuts? Well, some of them would be friends with and some of them I'd run a mile from. You know? <laughs> Somebody said to me in a long way, have you ever heard, do, 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 do you love your villains? I'm like, no, they're mad, bad people. <laughs> 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 Why would I love them? <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm satisfied when I've, I've, I've written a character that I, that I think is, is a rounded character, is a credible character, 
no matter how bad the things that they're doing, but I wouldn't want to go out and have a pizza with them. <laughs> um, so yeah, there are characters that I've, I've created that uh, yeah, I would be very happy to, to spend a few evenings with or longer with, um, but others that I think, you know, like, you know, you've got a face I'd never tire of slapping. <laughs> Well, it really depends on whether I'm writing a series novel or, or um, a standalone. Um, the starting point is is slightly different. Um, whatever I'm writing, story comes first. The idea for the story comes first. The shape of the story, what it's basically about, is the first thing. And on the basis of, of understanding what the story is, I, I, I know whether it's going to be Tony Hill, Carol Jordan, say, or if it's going to be a standalone, or if it's going to be something other series. Um, so once I've got that straight in my head, then I know what the first sort of steps in the journey are. If it's a series novel, um, I've got history with Tony and Carol, for example. I know who they are. I know how they got to be the person that they are. Um, and I know the history, I know the limitations. You know, Tony Hill isn't suddenly going to turn into an action hero. He's not going to suddenly turn around and punch somebody on the nose. You know, it's just not who he is. Um, so right away there, you've got, you've got the story being shaped by the limitations, by the history, by the possibilities of those characters. So already I know there are things I can do and I can't do within that kind of story. So moving forward in, in sort of thinking about the story, I have to bear those things in mind. So then I can actually apply those characteristics to, to what the bear wants the story I've got, and then move the story along in my head. And then I'll come. Then it becomes like you know, biofeedback, character feeds story, feeds story, feeds character. But with the standalone, to start in a different place. Again, it's the idea of the story that that, that, that kicks the whole thing off. But um, I don't know who the characters are in the story, so to begin with, I can just let my imagination run wild on the idea of the story. What are the possibilities of the story? Where could I possibly go with the story? Um, I have no limits, if you like, at that point. I can start thinking about the story in as big terms or as small terms as I want to. And then once I've got a sort of basic story shape, I start to think about whose story is this? Why would you behave in this way? Why would a person do these things? What's their history? What's made them that person? And so then I start to form the idea of who the characters are. And as, as I learn about the characters more, as I spend more time thinking about the characters and getting to know them, having conversations with them, then that also feeds into the story. Because the more I know about the characters, the more it shapes how the story can go. And so, again, you then end up in the same place as, you know, character feeds plot, feeds character feeds plot. Now you've said so it starts different, ends up saying, it's the short answer. <laughs> <laughs> you've said that you've 